Hello, um, I'm Rui Shavsh, a linguist at the State University of New York at Buffalo. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Abralin Ao Vivo, Linguists Online, an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. Today's talk is by Professor Elaine Francis from Purdue University. Elaine's research focuses on a wide range of topics, including syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and language processing. And she has a forthcoming book in Oxford University Press, a uh, great present for Christmas, um, entitled Gradient Acceptability in Linguistic Theory. Um, that book is related to today's talk, uh, Interpreting Gradient Acceptability, Judgments in Syntax. Thank you, Elaine, for accepting this invitation. I'm very much looking forward to it. And thanks for uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, and as a reminder, questions can be asked in the chat. Without further ado, the screen is yours, Elaine. Thank you, Roy. That's a really nice introduction. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Miguel Oliveira and all the organizers of our Berlin talk series, which has been a wonderful way for linguists to connect during this kind of terrible pandemic time. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. So I will just start by thanking some of my collaborators whose work you're gonna see in today's talk. Um, Laura Michaelis from University of Colorado, Josh Weirich, my recent graduate from Purdue, who's now a postdoc, Charles Lamb, uh, 2015 Purdue graduate, now at Hong Seng University, and uh, Carol Chun Jing, uh, 2017 Purdue graduate, now at Ohio State University, John Hitz, 2012 Purdue graduate, now at Central Oklahoma, and my longtime uh, collaborator from Hong Kong University, Stephen Matthews. So I'm gonna start like to make sense of, you know, why we use acceptability judgments in linguistics and syntax in particular. Um, it really only makes sense with a certain conception of what grammar is and where it's located. If we go back to the structuralist from the early 20th century, um, grammar was really conceived of as something that belonged to the speech community. Uh, so, so Sears said language is never complete in a single individual, but exists perfectly only in the collectivity. So the idea of long or language system was a collective entity. Uh, Bloomfield makes similar comments that linguists should be studying the speech habits of a community and we sh linguists should avoid um, kind of mentalistic views of psychology, which may tempt the observer to appeal to purely spiritual standards instead of reporting the facts. He says, we have no way of determining what speakers may feel. Now, it's not that Bloomfield didn't use his own tuitions. All linguists that wrote about grammar used their made use of their own tuitions. They made use of intuitions of their consultants, okay? But Bloomfield thought that this was uh, an urge to be resisted, that if we wanna be really objective, um, we, you know, we shouldn't appeal to this kind of um, intuition or spiritual standard. Now, as we all know, Chomsky had a different view of where grammar comes from, um, the mind of the individual. And if we take this as a premise, then we can make sense of why intuitive judgments have been so important for uh, synt syntactic research and other areas of linguistics. So Chomsky said that grammar uh, purports to be a description of the ideal speaker hearer's intrinsic competence, or competence is their implicit knowledge, which he distinguished clearly from performance or actual language use. And also importantly, uh, grammar was conceived of as a system of generative processes. So he highlighted the kind of productive and creative nature of language more so than the, the structuralists had done. And uh, hence we get the term generative grammar. So we have a problem if we wanna use intuitions to study grammar, knowledge is not directly observable. Only linguistic behavior is. How can we infer knowledge from behavior? 
So uh, Chomsky, 1965, and Aspex wrote about this and said that um, intuitive judgments of the acceptability of sentences provide the most useful insight into speakers' implicit knowledge. He considered other things like observations, experiments, and so forth, but he really thought that uh, linguistic intuitions were going to provide the clearest window into competence, even though he recognized it was not a perfect window. Uh, so we can look at the examples in A and B, and English speakers will typically judge A to be unacceptable and B to be acceptable, well, depending a little bit on dialect variation. Uh, so I'll assume a North American dialect for here. So just to take this example, um, we can judge sentence two as acceptable and sentence three as unacceptable. Joe doesn't have washed the dishes. But if we take a slightly different sentence um, and we make it negative, suddenly uh, the first one becomes unacceptable and the second one becomes acceptable. How do generative linguists model this kind of intuition-based uh, knowledge? Well, contrasting pairs or groups of sentences that differ minimally and inferring grammatical rules based on the contrast. And here, my apologies to Andrew Radford for uh, the sentence trees uh, taken from his textbook. So in number one, uh, we can analyze have as an auxiliary verb, whereas in three, we can analyze it as a lexical verb. The auxiliary verb have occurs higher in the structure where it can combine with the negation, and the lexical verb have occurs lower in the structure where it's not able to combine with the negation. And that's just the kind of reasoning that generative linguists tend to use based on these kind of sentence judgments. All right. So why should we use intuitive judgments to model grammar? Um, have, has anything changed since Chomsky 1965? Well, I think that most linguists still find them really useful. Uh, we can investigate sentence types that rarely occur. We can obtain information about um, what speakers feel is not possible. We can uh, possibly distinguish speech errors from rare constructions. And most importantly, we can control for extraneous factors like word choice and directly compare sentences with only minimal differences. Now, you know, the use of judgments has not been without critics, and this goes back a long time. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Labov talked about uh, concern for infor informal and uncontrolled methods, variation within and across speakers, and gradient patterns of responses. Similarly, Lefelt uh, in 1972 expressed concern about how do we interpret metalinguistic performance in a judgment task, which may be affected by many factors other than competence. So now I'll jump ahead to the 1990s. I call it the hopeful 1990s because um, of this groundbreaking work by Carson Schutze, the empirical base of linguistics, where he reviews these early criticisms and argues convincingly that judgment data when properly controlled provide a rich source of information about grammatical knowledge. Um, and he recommended carefully chosen population samples, um, carefully constructed sentence materials and a factorial design, multiple participants, multiple sentence sets with different lexical content, filler sentences, varied order, presentation, and so forth. Uh, measurement scales that be, can be quantified uh, such as rating scales and statistical techniques to identify systematic variation and factor out random variation. And he also recommended additional sources of data like production tasks, comprehension tasks, and analysis of spontaneous discourse to kind of supplement the um, judgments. And, um, you know, inspired by this, there. Uh, and, and I can't forget this important textbook by Wayne Cowart published in 1997 that made similar recommendations and practical suggestions 
for how to set up uh, sentence judgment experiments. And um, so this field of experimental syntax has been emerging over the last 25 years and, um, and has produced quite a lot of research since then. So I'm gonna highlight two of the ongoing controversies surrounding the use of intuitive judgments. The first is to what extent are traditional informal methods of data collection acceptable for modern syntax research? Um, and a majority of generative linguists do find them acceptable for most purposes. And this position has been supported with evidence that most grammaticality contrasts reported in the formal syntax literature on English can be verified using experimental methods. Uh, it was an important paper by Sprouse, Schussi, and Almeida, 2013. On the other side, there are a few who take the opposing position that well-controlled quantitative methods are almost always to be preferred. Um, and there's an important position paper by Gibson and Federenko and commentaries on that from 2013. And then more recently, I will uh, point to this 2020 volume on linguistic intuitions, where both sides of this debate are taken up in more recent research. Okay, but that's all I'm going to say today about the first controversy. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk, the book itself focuses mainly on the second controversy, which is that language is multifaceted, but rating scales are one dimensional. How can we tease apart the different factors in addition to syntactic knowledge that can affect judgments? So this includes knowledge of semantic, discourse pragmatic, sociolinguistic, and prosodic constraints, effects of general cognitive mechanisms like working memory capacity, task effects like presentation order, modality of presentation, linguistic experience of individuals can be very important, and, um, and, other, and there's other factors. Uh, this controversy is the theme of the two um, edited volumes that you see here. And, uh, and the book kind of takes up this controversy as a major theme. So to just give a flavor of what I mean by different sources for acceptability judgments, different things that can cause a sentence to be less acceptable, I'll go back to Chomsky 1965. Uh, he talked about the sentences given here. And he considers uh, two possible explanations for why sentences two, three, and four seem to be less acceptable than the first one. The first is a syntactic explanation that sentences two through four are all ungrammatical due to incompatible syntactic features. And the second is a semantic explanation, which says that sentence two, uh, the selectional restriction violation, is syntactically well-formed, but semantically anomalous, uh, while sentences three and four are actually syntactically ill-formed and ungrammatical, in addition to being semantically anomalous. And ultimately, um, he settles on the first explanation, uh, while others have settled on the second explanation. But that's, that's just an example. And you can also see that these sentences uh, are not so clear cut. Sentences two and three seem a little bit more acceptable than sentence four. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. So the current book, which um, I'm told is out in December, at least in the UK and maybe in North America, you can get it by February. Um, the guiding question of this book is, uh, what conclusions can we draw from gradient patterns of judgments about language users' implicit grammatical knowledge? The major arguments are that the answer depends in part on one's theoretical assumptions, that regardless of one's theoretical framework, data from converging methods can help narrow the range of plausible interpretations. And finally, and this is probably the most controversial one, um, soft constraints within the grammar are helpful for understanding some patterns of judgments. The inspiration was uh, for my own experimental research over the past 
15 years where I noticed that we got these really sometimes hard to interpret gradient patterns of judgments. And, uh, and more directly, my experimental syntax course at Purdue, um, which is going to be in, in the, the next iteration of it is going to use this book as one of the main texts. And, uh, and also my interest in theory comparison dates back to my grad school days at Chicago. And this book presents an overview of current debates and is intended primarily as a resource for graduate students and graduate teaching. Um, I hope other people will read it as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theoretical assumptions and differences between frameworks. And then I'm gonna jump into uh, three data sets to kind of illustrate the points. So I'll start with what assumptions seem to be shared by the different generative frameworks. One is that linguistic knowledge is mentally represented, um, that there is a competence that underlies performance. The linguistic knowledge is generative and allowing users to produce an infinite variety of novel utterances. That linguistic knowledge consists of categories and constraints on their combination. And that linguistic knowledge is at least one of the factors that underlies language users' intuitions about well-formedness of utterances. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the assumptions that um, differ between frameworks. And there's many assumptions that differ between frameworks, but I'm just gonna talk about two of the ones that, that I think are important for understanding interpretation of judgment data. One is strong form meaning isomorphism. This is the idea that there is a consistent relationship between elements of syntactic structure and elements of meaning, especially with respect to semantic argument structure and discourse information structure. The second idea is the idea of gradient grammaticality. Um, the idea that gra grammaticality is not binary and that grammatical constraints may vary in strength and may contribute to statistical preferences rather than strict ungrammaticality. And this is um, an oversimplified representation of how I see the different families of frameworks falling on these two questions. So derivational theories tend to assume strong form meaning isomorphism, but not gradient grammaticality. Constraint-based theories tend to assume neither, but there is variation in whether you get gradient grammaticality, depending on whether they take a usage-based approach or not. And then the OT style theories, which assume a strong form meaning isomorphism, but not gradient grammaticality. And again, there's variation among the different OT style theories. So what do I mean by strong form meaning isomorphism? Examples are uniform data assignment, verbal event head, a movement, empty pronouns, and functional projections. Uh, derivational theories uh, accept these things and constraint-based theories tend not to, and instead uh, allow for flexible form meaning mappings. Here is just a brief example from EMBIC 2004. So we have this acceptability contrast uh, between the door was carefully opened, which seems okay, and the door was carefully open, which seems slightly off. And um, I've marked it with an asterisk. It could just, it could well be a question mark. Um, it was marked with an asterisk in the paper. So the difference that you can see is that open is a, a passive participle and open is an adjective. And um, Embix analysis says that, well, the reason you get this difference in interpretation between the verbal and the adjectival constructions is that the first one has a little v in the structure and the second one doesn't have a little v. So when little v is absent, only a state of interpretation is possible. So that's what I mean by the, the form meaning isomorphism, this semantic difference between the two sentences is captured in terms of a structural difference in the tree. 
Uh, for a constraint-based theory, um, we could account for the same contrast in terms of lexical features without putting it into the structure. All right, the second idea is gradient grammaticality. And I'm going back to this example from Chomsky 1965. And instead of labeling it as more acceptable and less acceptable, I'm gonna label it as fully grammatical and, and moderately deviant and fully ungrammatical. Well, what, is, what does this mean? Traditionally, neither derivational theories nor constraint-based theories permit gradient grammaticality. A structural description either violates the constraint or it does not. However, Chomsky 1965 gave a gradient grammaticality analysis. Uh, he said that there are different degrees of structural deviance for selectional restrictions, subcategorization so violations, and lexical category errors, with the latter being the strongest violation. So Chomsky already had this idea of gradient constraint strength. And it was taken up uh, later in barriers when he talked about strong and weak islands. Um, and more recently, some of the OT style frameworks have incorporated soft constraints within the grammar in a systematic way and a quantitative way in order to account for gradient variation in judgments. And the easiest way to think about these approaches is that each constraint is associated with a violation cost. And so the violation cost in number four is greater than the violation cost in number three or number two. Okay, so, so that's just the most, there's different ways of implementing soft constraints, but I think that's the most intuitive way to think about it. And I can't forget usage-based functionalist frameworks, which also incorporate gradients directly into the linguistic representations. And these representations are derived from experience with language over a lifetime of use. And in the book, I, I talk about how the usage-based uh, frameworks fit in. So from here, I'm gonna give three examples uh, of data sets to illustrate these points. The first two are, um, are uh, given in the book, relative clause extraposition in English is a subsection from chapter six, resumptive pronouns in Cantonese is a subsection of chapter seven. And then I'll end with an example that was uh, too new to uh, make it into the book but it's from Josh Weirich's dissertation on ditransitive constructions in English. So I'll start with relative clause extraposition in English, which um, Laura Michaelis and I have worked on on several publications. And um, this is a phenomenon where a subject modifying relative clause um, gets displaced to a position following the verb phrase three people came to the party who had just met. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about two constraints on relative clause and extraposition. The first one is the name constraint. The basic intuition here is that um, the extraposition is more acceptable when the subject is an indefinite noun phrase compared to a definite noun phrase. And the second one I'll call the predicate constraint. And this is um, the idea that extraposition is more acceptable across a verb of appearance, such as come or arrive, uh, compared to a non-appearance verb. And you can see in number four, I've got a, a transitive verb there and it's uh, less acceptable. Walker 2013 was the first to test these two constraints in a judgment task. And um, so she manipulated definiteness of the subject and verb type. Um, all, all of her verbs were intransitive, either um, appearance or non-appearance. And what she found was that the sentences like in A, um, were the most acceptable. And the sentences like in D with a definite noun phrase and a non-appearance verb were the least acceptable. And, um, and basically uh, it was an additive effect. 
And here is just some data from our lab from uh, Josh Weirich um, showing that, that followed up on this and showed more evidence for the predicate constraint with a wider range of verbs. Um, so the appearance verbs here on the left and then three different types of non-appearance verbs. And you can see with the appearance verbs, uh, the extra position sentences were just as acceptable as the canonical sentences. But with the other three classes of verbs, the extra position sentences were less acceptable. So we got pretty clear um, confirmation for the predicate constraint. We also had a discourse manipulation that ended up not showing anything. All right, so what did the additive effects of definiteness and verb type that Walker found actually mean? Um, and there's at least two options here. Walker herself proposed that these restrictions are soft constraints of the syntax discourse interface following Sirachi and Keller's approach. They induce mild unacceptability. They apply in a gradient and additive manner. They're subject to context effects and they're viable. So their analysis actually assumes gradient grammaticality and flexible form meaning mappings. Garon 1980, uh, obviously she didn't know about Walker's data from 2013, but, um, but she, you know, Walker was following up on her analysis um, where she proposed that these effects of verb type and definiteness reflect an underlying interpretive constraint, uh, basically a presentational function, which must apply in order for extraposition to be syntactically licensed. In her view, this was not a viable constraint. However, it was not tied to any specific morphology. So um, as long as you could construe it in this function within the context, then extraposition was possible. So what uh, her approach might say is about Walker's data is, well, these sentences are taken out of context and some of them are just easier to construe in the, um, and the right interpretation than other ones. And you could account for the gradients in that way. So here is some corpus data, uh, Francis and Michaela's 2014, where we looked at the rate of extraposition versus canonical order in the international corpus of English Great Britain. And we found that the highest rate of extraposition, if we're looking at verb type indefiniteness, is the indefinite noun phrases with the um, with the presentational or, or appearance verbs. Okay. And the lowest rate was the definite noun phrases and the non-appearance verbs. So it's pretty similar to what Walker found with the judgment data. Uh, and we did find a number of exceptions but it's not clear whether they're really exceptions or whether this more abstract idea of presentational function could account for them. Um, and here is just kind of um, a different view of the data. This is a profile of different properties of extraposed versus non-extraposed sentences in the corpus. And basically we found that 98% of the extraposition sentences have a discourse new subject. However, 19% have a definite marked subject, so that seems to violate the name constraint. 30% have a non-appearance verb, that seems to violate the predicate constraint. Um, as far as accounting for these exceptional cases, we can go a long way with looking at uh, the length effects. So short before long phrase order is known to, excuse me, to uh, facilitate sentence production uh, across different constructions in different languages. And this was certainly true of extra position. We found a very high incidence when the um, relative clause was at least five times longer than the verb phrase. And we found a very low incidence when the relative clause was the same length or shorter than the verb phrase. And you can see like in example 15a, even though the discourse function doesn't seem to be the typical one. Uh, 
that you would get with these uh, with this construction, you have this very long relative clause at the end that motivates the um, the extra position because it's just easier to say a long phrase if it comes at the end. It gives you more time to plan for it. Okay, so that accounts for at least some of the exceptions in terms of this length constraint. Um, I'll move on to another study, uh, Francis and Michaela's 2017, where we looked at elicited production and um, specifically the length effect and the definiteness effect. So we contrasted, um, we had uh, participants do a sentence construction task where they saw these three phrases on the screen and they had to form a sentence using the underlying phrase first and they could put the other phrases in whatever order they wanted to. And we manipulated definiteness of the subject and, um, and phrase length. So you can see that the most natural case for extra position is this first sentence and the least natural case is this second sentence. And, uh, and this is exactly what we found uh, in terms of choice of structure, the indefinite noun phrase and the short before long order yielded the highest rate of extra position. And then the, um, the definite subject and the long before short order yielded the lowest rate. And then we see a similar effect and we measured how long it start, took speakers to start speaking. And for the extra position sentences, we got the, um, the fastest times in this uh, condition that yielded the most examples. And we got the slowest times in the condition that yielded the least examples of extra position. And there was no definite effect on response times for the canonical sentences. This seemed to be specific to the extra position sentences. So just to summarize, the name constraint and the predicate constraint um, show reliable effects on acceptability. They are additive and not as strong as we might expect if they were strict grammatical constraints. Uh, the corpus analysis shows that both constraints were violated in language use. This resulted in tokens where the subject was topical and the predicate was focal, which is the opposite of the the kind of typical presentational reading that you, that you get. And the production data show that speakers were sensitive to the definiteness of the subject in their online production, even though, the, um, even though there wasn't a strict requirement for an indefinite subject, it took them a long, little longer to produce it if they had a definite subject and they didn't use the definite subjects as often. And then both of these constraints interacted with the short before long bias and the length constraint. looking at our corpus data, it explains some, but not all of the exceptional cases. So the exceptional cases suggest that a presentational discourse function cannot be a strict grammatical requirement in the way that Garon uh, understood it. And, um, and we agree with Walker that a soft constraint analysis is supported, uh, especially in terms of the production data where the initiation times were sensitive to definiteness, but only for the extra position sentences and not for the canonical sentences. So it seems to be a construction specific requirement. And, um, and that's why we thought that it probably didn't make sense to analyze it as kind of a general discourse phenomenon because it seemed to be so construction specific. Uh, there are other ways you could analyze it. You could say the exceptional cases were production errors. You could say that those exceptional cases have a different syntactic derivation and they don't count as relative clause extraposition. They're really something else. Or, um, or you, could, uh, you could kind of try to support this more general discourse account. So that, that's kind of um, the argument that, that we made in the paper and, uh, and that I talked about in the book. All right, so the next example that I wanna talk about 
It has to do with resumptive pronouns in Cantonese. And I'll just give an English example to, to start to remind you what I'm talking about here. So this is where you have an ordinary, what looks like an ordinary pronoun, and it gets inserted in a position where you would otherwise find a gap uh, within a relative clause. And it can be other constructions besides relative clauses, but I only talk about relative clauses here. So this is the flavor that I wasn't sure whether you'd like it, and that it gets stuck in at the end. Um, moving on to uh, Cantonese, uh, it's a really interesting language to look at because unlike English, it does have resumptive pronouns that are grammatically required to make the sentence well-formed. And it also has resumptive pronouns that are grammatically optional and they vary according to complexity of the structure. So this made it a really interesting case to look at. Um, just to give you a basic overview of Cantonese, according to um, Matthews and Yip's grammatical description. They are ungrammatical in subject relatives, optional, but just preferred in simple object relatives, optional, but preferred in possessive relatives, and required in prepositional object and coverb object relatives. I'll show you in a moment what I mean by coverb, but the requirement is to avoid this kind of um, movement violation that you would otherwise get with the gapped construction. So just to give you a little background on coverbs, uh, these are serial verbs that occur first in a series of verbs and they have preposition-like functions. Um, so you can see the example in one, this first verb meaning help is uh, considered a coverb and there are a limited number of coverbs in Cantonese. Uh, in our um, 2006 paper, Steve Matthews and I were looking at this coverb stranding constraint uh, to see whether it showed up in a formal acceptability judgment task. And uh, we found that it did. So sentences like two were judged as relatively unacceptable where they have a gap in the position of the object following the coverb. And this is kind of just a simple structure to show you what that noun phrase looks like. And we interpreted this as a, a coverb stranding constraint. And we didn't test this uh, in that study, but we predicted that the constraint should not apply when a resumptive pronoun is present. So if you put the pronoun in this place, this should make the sentence just fine. So um, in Francis, uh, at all 2015, we followed up on this and we looked at both the gapped and the resumptive conditions. Um, we tested 12 conditions in all. I'm only gonna show you six of them today so that we're not here all day. So uh, this was a judgment task where the sentences were, were presented orally through headphones. And we did this to avoid interference from standard Chinese. Um, and I'll just, I hope this works. That's the subject relative. Here's the direct object relative. And here is, that's the covert relative. And these are the three resumptive conditions. We also had the gap conditions where the pronoun would be missing from the sentences. And this is what we found for the judgment task. It, when, I mean, I saw the data when, it, when we first got it and I'm like, wow, that's a little too neat, but it's real. I, tr I promise it's actually real. Um, so the resumptive pronoun conditions, you can see that the judgments are low for a subject relative, they're higher for the direct object and they're highest for the coverb object. And then we get the opposite for the gap sentences where the subject relatives are most acceptable with a gap, object relatives somewhat less acceptable, and then um, the coverb relatives are least acceptable with a gap. You can see this clear difference where speakers prefer the uh, resumptive for the coverb condition. And we followed this up with an elicited production experiment to see what
speakers would do actually these were the same speakers they actually did the production task first and then they did the judgment task a week later so as not to kind of bias their uh, productions um and in this experiment it was a, a sentence construction task where they saw on the screen these two phrases and they heard them through the headphones okay and then uh, they had to speak a sentence based on these two phrases and they had to end the sentence with the last three characters and this surprisingly uh, worked for eliciting relative clauses so here's a sample response in the in this sample response the participant put a resumptive pronoun in there um, in some of the responses, they left it out. Uh, so this task allowed them to freely choose whether to insert the pronoun or not. And uh, if you look at this bottom line, um, this corresponds to the conditions that I showed you on the judgment task. The subject relatives, uh, they produce very few resumptive pronouns. They produce more with the object relatives. and when you get to the covert relatives, the rate increases by quite a lot. So 79% of the productions in the covert relatives uh, inserted a resumptive pronoun. Now, a very interesting thing um, happens when we look at the individual coverbs. And what you see here is the condition that's supposed to be ungrammatical. This is the coverbs with a gap condition. And, um, and we can see that for some of the coverbs, they, uh, this condition was rated relatively acceptable. And for some of the coverbs, it was rated quite low. And then some of them were in the middle. So different coverbs appear to tolerate extraction of their objects to different degrees. So that was really interesting. And the lowest acceptability was for what, what was often considered the most preposition-like of the coverbs, which is tong, which means uh, with. And then we saw almost the same pattern with the production data. So this is the coverbs arranged in the same order as before. And we can see that we have a lower rate of production with some of them and 100% with this tong coverb. So this most preposition-like one seems to require a resumptive pronoun. The other ones are more variable. So um, what can we get from this in terms of interpreting our judgment data? Well, they're consistent with a strict grammatical constraint on coverb stranding as we proposed in the earlier study. However, the production data showed that speakers violated the constraint in 21% of their productions. Okay, and then the analysis of individual coverbs showed variation in the strength of constraint um, that went in the same direction for acceptability and production. So if it's not a strict grammatical constraint, maybe it's just, uh, uh, maybe it's grammatically optional and there's this processing constraint that can account for the judgments and the productions. Well, the processing idea does explain the optionality of the result of pronoun, but it doesn't specifically predict the variation among the individual verbs. And so, uh, so we kind of speculated at the end of that paper well, maybe a conventionalized soft constraint analysis along the lines of what Sam Featherston has proposed in his decathlon model. So in, in that model, the violation cost um, can be different for different constructions. And, uh, and, and in this case, it seems to be different even for different coverbs. And this could provide an alternative uh, analysis for, uh, for these data. All right, so that's the coverbs. And um, I'll give you one last example, which is uh, newer data that didn't make it 
into the book. Well, this is data on the date of alternation in English. So the date of alternation is the possibility that a verb can occur in both the propositional object and the double object constructions. These are semantically equivalent, at least for some verbs, but structurally distinct. And, um, and also contributing to this alternation is the heavy NP shift construction, which is the reverse order of the propositional object construction, where the proposition phrase comes before the uh, noun phrase. And several studies have looked at what's called the givenness constraint. This shows up in the double object and heavy noun phrase sentences uh, as being less acceptable and dispreferred when the referent of the first postverbal argument is new or less accessible. And interestingly, the propositional object sentences were not affected by this constraint. Um, and this was verified by judgment tasks in Clifton and Frazier, and um, also by reading self-based reading tasks in Brown, Savova, and Gibson. Uh, so they found this givenness constraint that shows up in judgments and it shows up in uh, self-based reading, um, but only for the double object and the heavy NP shift sentences, it did not show up for the propositional object sentences, which seem to be okay either way, either uh, new before given or given before new. And this brings me to uh, Josh Weirich's lovely 2021 dissertation, where he looked at this question of how the givenness constraint applies across different task types and in different populations of speakers. In particular, he was interested in bilinguals, late bilingual speakers uh, from German and Spanish speaking backgrounds, um, and whether uh, the givenness constraint would show up in uh, the different tasks for the different groups. He recruited um, 180 speakers, 60 monolingual English speakers, 60 German English bilinguals living in Germany, and 60 Spanish English bilinguals living in Mexico. Um, the bilingual speakers did not learn English from their parents or caregivers and generally began learning English in school. And he chose these two groups because the, um, the structural options for ditransitive sentences are a little bit different for um, Spanish and German. And I can talk more about that in the, um, the question session if you're interested. So the tasks uh, were the scalar acceptability judgment task, a self-paced reading task, and a two sentence first preference task. Um, each speaker did all three tasks and they counterbalanced the order. Uh, it was administered uh, online over Ibex Farm, which worked out well during the pandemic. And um, the, uh, the stimuli were, uh, were barred from the study by Brown at all. And they consisted of a context sentence followed by a test sentence. So here's an example of um, the context sentence followed by the test sentence. The context sentence tells you which argument is given. In this case, it's the secretary. So that shows up as a definite noun phrase in the test sentence. The new argument is a toy that shows up as an indefinite noun phrase. And the structure in this case is heavy noun phrase shift. And here's what the, um, the task looked like for acceptability judgments, where they had to read the context sentence and rate the test, they had to rate the bold face sentence uh, uh, as to how natural it was in that context. And these are the results. So you can see that there's uh, the three speaker groups are from left to right. And uh, within each speaker group, we have the propositional object, the double object, and the heavy NP shift. And this um, is pretty much exactly what was found in previous studies. All three groups showed an effective givenness constraint in the double object and heavy noun phrase sentences, and not in the propositional object sentences. 
And then uh, the only group difference that we found was that the Spanish English bilinguals gave the heavy noun phrase sentences higher ratings overall than the other two groups, but the givenness effect was similar. The second task is a forced choice preference task where they see uh, the context sentence and then they see two possible continuations and they have to choose which of these two sentences fits better in the context. In this particular example, we have the prepositional object sentence in number one and the heavy noun phrase sentence in number two the prepositional object sentence has a new given order and the heavy noun phrase paraphrase has a given new order. And here is our results for a prepositional object versus heavy noun phrase sentences. We can see that all three groups chose heavy noun phrase more often in the given new order, which is on the right, compared to the new given order on the left. So all three groups show the same trend. And again, the Spanish English bilinguals chose heavy noun phrase more often than the other two groups across both orders. Um, but the, the contrast for givenness uh, was similar. So this is a lot like what we found in the judgment task. And then here is the comparison between the double object and the prepositional object sentences. So they were, they were compared separately from the heavy noun phrase sentences so that all they had to choose was uh, between a pair. All three groups chose the double object more often with the given new order on the right compared to the new given order on the left. And you can see a clear contrast for all three groups. And uh, the, only, uh, the only effect of group here was that the Spanish English bilinguals uh, showed less difference between the given new and new given order compared with the other groups. This did come out as a significant um, interaction in the model. Um, but as you can see, the, the givenness effect is still very clear for the Spanish English group. So just to summarize that data, the givenness, and, and um, I skipped over the self-paced reading data uh, but I can uh, talk about that in the, in the discussion if you want. Uh, the givenness constraint affects acceptability of double object and heavy noun phrase sentences across all three groups. And as expected, the prepositional object sentences were not subject to the givenness constraint for these tasks, um, or for the acceptability task. Um, and then in the forced choice task, uh, the choice of double object and having MP was, um, was, pre was affected by givenness across all groups. It seemed to show a weaker effect in the Spanish English group. And this could be related to a lack of close double object equivalent in Spanish. Um, and it also could be partly the nature of the forced preference task because the this did not show this weaker effect did not show up in the judgment task. It was the same for all three groups. And um, the group differences held when English proficiency and exposure were taken into effect. So to come back to our kind of overarching question, is this um, best analyzed as a soft constraint in the grammar or a general discourse principle or something else. Well, nobody, unlike the case of the Cantonese uh, co-verb stranding constraint, and unlike in the case of the predicates constraint and the name constraint, nobody has actually claimed that the givenness constraint is some kind of strict grammatical constraint, okay? But the pattern of data is kind of similar to what we've seen with these other constraints in that it seems to be construction specific. Um, we could entertain the possibility that it's a general discourse preference for given new order, but we have to somehow explain why this preference doesn't show up in the prepositional object sentences. A soft constraint analysis, which assumes gradient grammaticality and flexible form meaning mappings can accommodate stronger or weaker, weaker givenness effects across the different constructions. Um, 
And I will say that we did see a little bit of a givenness effect in the self-paced reading data that we didn't see in the judgment or the forced choice data. So that was interesting. So maybe this givenness constraint has different strengths for different constructions. And we also can explain differences between different populations of speakers by uh, uh, saying that it has a different strength value in grammars of different speakers. Um, right, so to conclude, uh, gradient judgment data are often ambiguous in interpretation. And I think all of the cases that I discussed today can be given alternative theoretical interpretations. Okay. Um, theoretical assumptions about form meaning isomorphism and gradient grammaticality are going to influence how we interpret these uh, data sets. Um, and another point is that we can use other data sources to kind of supplement our findings from judgments and give us a clearer picture of what's going on. So we can use corpus data to refine the formulations of the constraints and to identify possible exceptions. We can use elicited production and other experimental tasks to shed further light on what's going on. And finally, I've argued that soft constraints within the grammar can be helpful for understanding patterns of judgments, which are construction specific and which do not appear to be reducible to general discourse or processing factors. Okay, that's all I've got for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. That was great. Um, the floor is open for questions. There currently aren't are questions. Should, on I, the... should I unshare the screen or should yes. I Yes, yeah, okay. I think so. Um, but I will ask you a couple of questions in a while people are thinking about those. Um, I always struggle a little bit with the notion of graded grammaticality because I was brought up inside a box <laughs> where things are or aren't. Um, uh, that would be the typical um, symbolic theory of grammar, uh, either GB or minimalism or LFG or whatever. Yep. Um, but when I have to think about graded grammaticality, I kind of think of a number attached to constraints, maybe linguistic dependencies or maybe feature-like uh, information um, that ha comes with a number um, that gives you the gradients. Somehow the, those numbers all put together or processed together you'll give you a complicated landscape of patterns and those are created. Um, is that kind of how you are inclined to think about it? Uh, and if it is, wouldn't you say that those are malleable, that you can actually change those numbers with enough data, you should be able to change people's grammars? Uh, yeah, okay. So, so um, there are two kind of main approaches to the soft constraints that, uh, that I reviewed in the book. One is kind of the OT style. And uh, so like linear optimality theory and Decathlon model, and they do kind of attach a violation cost, which is a number uh, to each constraint. Um, and then in some of the approaches like stochastic OT, that, um, that, that number can get perturbed before the output so that the constraint rankings can be reversed a certain, a certain percentage of the time. So that number is kind of like the likelihood that that constraint is going to apply. So that, that's one way of looking at it. And then another way that I looked at in the book was in terms of a usage-based model, um, similar to what Adele Goldberg proposes in her 2019 book, uh, which is looking at notions of entrenchment and um, notions like statistical preemption, that, um, that you're going to have a, a certain kind of prototypical construction 
And when you violate that prototype in various ways, you're going to get um, uh, judgments of ill formedness. And mm -hmm. those judgments are going to vary according to usage patterns. So it's a much more, the second one is much more fine grained and much more attuned to like individual verb bias and things like that. I don't so know, maybe, does that make sense? Yeah, so maybe, so maybe I'm, I'm always thinking of uh, adaptation. So maybe the, uh, the OT style count how many constraints are violated wouldn't predict necessarily that these things are malleable. Right. But the other ones based on the input, based on the frequencies of the mm -hmm. input should in principle be malleable to some extent. I'm thinking of... And I think there are ways to make both approaches malleable. Okay. And yeah. Fair enough. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm not an expert on OT style approaches, and I, I really only dived into it um, when researching for this book, but it's it's really interesting stuff. So. Enough about me. Um, <laughs> Anna Clara Polankoff asks, uh, when you take empirical data into account and you get percentages in data that show constant violations of constraints, should we extrapolate that constraints should be soft? So I'm pasting that in the chat so you can... Uh... Well, I think that that is one conclusion that you can draw from that, um, but it's not the only conclusion that you could draw. And you can talk about performance errors or... You can talk about, well, maybe there's, um, maybe we're not looking at one construction, maybe we're looking at two different constructions and that's why you get different patterns of data. So, so yeah, I think that you could say it's a soft constraint or if you don't believe that soft constraint is a valid notion, um, you could come up with other ways to account for it. Um Antonio Codina asks, regarding acceptability judgment tasks in SLA, I would like to know if the terms used in a Likert scale could influence the participant's judgment. That is, if one uses, for example, more formal terms like acceptable, partially acceptable, or more common terms like normal, not very normal, strange, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think that Wayne Cowart has looked at at the instruction, the effective instructions, and really didn't find much differences depending on instructions, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't find differences. So yeah, it's, it's possible that you could find differences depending on instructions. Right, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ask about grammaticality um, to a non-linguist um, informant, but- uh, Oh, right, yeah, you, right you yeah. ask about naturalness or yeah. something like that, yeah. So no other questions, um, more questions? Now you had a, you had some extra slides that I, you know, I took a peek at involving um, the complementizer that, and I was very curious about what you oh. want to say about that because uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out from the surrounding slides what the what the message was. But uh, oh, okay, should I share those? Um, I might have them still somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. no questions currently. Oh yeah, here it was. So yeah, I had this um, slide of uh, relative clauses with and without the word that. And if we take out the word that, the first one becomes less acceptable and the second one is still okay. So the difference is that the first one is a subject relative and the second one is an object relative. And- right. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason for that probably has to do with the fact that if you take out that in the case of the subject relative, then it becomes more ambiguous and it's becomes like a, 
the uh, it comes like a main clause instead of uh, instead of a relative clause, and it makes it more confusing. But um, but this has also been analyzed in terms of a strict grammatical constraint. So so yeah, that's, I I don't have any deep insights on on that one, but I think it probably has to do something with parsing. Sorry, I got kicked out, as I predicted <laughs> to you earlier, um, but I'm back. Uh, gotcha. But I saw, I, I heard most of what you said. Um, So my, I'll ask another question. My feeling about resumptives is that there are several kinds of resumptives in English. Um, some may be grammatical and others less so. Maybe they're mistakes or um, well, like people have, have mm -hmm, like produ production errors or trying to circumvent an island or a constraint of other kinds. Um, do you, do, do, did you, go that far in thinking about resumption or did you uh, stay away from that? Yeah, well- it, it's, it's a can of worms, it's, it's really is a- It, it really... is, I mean, I, I do dive into it in chapter seven. Um, I talk about English, Hebrew and Cantonese. So right. the, um, what I showed you for Cantonese is just one small section. Uh, for English, uh, yeah, I talk about the whole debate over whether they're grammatical or ungrammatical and what their purpose is. And um, basically, I think that they probably are sometimes grammatical, especially in possessive constructions. Um, that's the guy that I told you about, his sister, right. uh, that kind of thing. And in, um, so, so it's, yeah, I talked about how they probably are grammatical in some contexts and in other contexts, they're more of a production phenomenon. All right. I do have a question. I posted it in the chat, but I'll read it so that everybody can see it or hear it. Um, a question is from Laura Michaelis. Um, regarding the soft constraints on the ditransitive theme and recipient arguments, i.e. theme equal topic or given, recipient equals focus to new, it is indeed a soft constraint as never give a sucker as even a break suggests. But then the constraint appears pretty hard when it comes to scope ambiguity. So they gave a child every gift only has a reading of one lucky kid while they gave a gift to every child allows for multiple gifts. Um, and to continue, I think this follows from obligatory wide scope of existential uh, quantifier theme, hence topicality. Mm -hmm. So you've got more than one constraint interacting, and in that case, that's going to override your givenness constraint, and, and you just have to use whatever order gets the right scope, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I think, I think that was the entirety of oh, our Thank question. you, Laura. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I think the interface has a character limit for the questions. So oh. <laughs> uh, if one does not know that, has to break it down to oh. <laughs> small messages, which works, uh, but yeah. um, took a while for it, that to be typed. You did a good job, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> this is a difficult medium, she adds. Um, <laughs> what would you say to, this is a, just a personal curiosity. Um, uh, what would you say to someone who's skeptical uh, of the uh, competence performance distinction? Um, can we settle that debate today here right now about whether um, the distinction is useful, it exists 
I'm on the, on the side where that it does exist and it is useful, um, but maybe um, I wouldn't push it as much as it has, it was traditionally pushed. I, I do think that there are speech errors <laughs> and speech errors are a reflection of um, um, improper use of the knowledge that you have to have in order to encode and decode linguistic information. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I agree with you, Roy, that that's how I was brought up to, to think about competence and performance as being different things. I've kind of gradually taken to more of a usage-based perspective over the years, but I think that there's still a useful distinction between knowledge that's represented in memory and uh, use of language in real time. And that, you know, when, when you're using language, you're, you, you're using that knowledge, but you're also innovating and, mm -hmm. and you might come up with something that will be judged as a speech error, right? And so, yeah, I, I, I think it's a useful distinction. I guess um, I can't, I probably can't convince people that it is if they don't think so. Right. <laughs> We will need some N700 or P125 uh, uh, <laughs> signal to convince for proof for sure that there's a difference between um, well, there, there's, ungrammatical there's, and Yeah, there's plenty, error, of, there's plenty right. of evidence that we find certain sentences anomalous based on our, now, our previous experience. Of course. Um, if, if you want to call that previous experience something other than competence, I guess you can. Um, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Okay. Aurora adds. So bolstering to have support for soft constraints because in the past, those of us proposing them have been told we're not explaining. Well, if you can explain without describing all the data, then what is your explanation worth? That's, that's my <laughs> feeling right. about it. <laughs> well, behavior phenomena, behavioral phenomena needs to be uh, described. Mm -hmm. formalized, predicted, and explained too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And especially um, integrated with theories of competence and knowledge, right? Somehow these things need to talk to each other. And so, yeah, I think that's really useful. Yeah, and, and I, I think that both the OT style and the usage-based approaches mm -hmm. offer um, excellent avenues for implementing soft constraints in a way that can be predictive. So that's that's my feeling, but you know, obviously that's gonna be the most controversial claim in this book and, mm -hmm. and not everybody's gonna agree. That's what books are for in this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get to get by the uh, the reviewer B uh, in <laughs> in journal publications. That's get, right. Get to play with ideas in a bigger scale and uh, you know be bolder. That's great. That's the right thing to do, I think. All right, no more questions. Going once, going <laughs> twice. All right, if not, we uh, conclude this Aberlin talk. Thank you, Elaine, so much uh, on behalf of Aberlin and everyone watching. Um, I invite people to continue coming uh, to the to the site for the series and uh, looking forward to the next talk. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Roy, and, and thanks to uh, Miguel and all the organizers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.